We'll pray, and you know, we'll get going. Is that okay? Yeah. Elder Bruce, would you pray for us tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you for just this opportunity to take a break from our busy week and just get together and dig into your word. And I just pray that each one of us will come with an open mind and an open heart and ears to hear what you're going to say as we use Pastor Scott in mighty ways to really open up your word to us tonight, Father. Give us ears that will hear tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Quick reminder as we have been going through <clears throat> the prophets over and 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 over. God speaks this message. A big swat is coming on your bottom side, but after that, we will apply the ice pack. Okay? And it's going to be. Discipline, it's going to be painful because you, you, you have to. you got to go through it because you will not change. It's clear. I've given you every chance possible. You're not going to change. And so I've got to get serious about this with you. Uh, but when that's over, and it's going to be really rough, you'll need to keep in mind that uh, you'll have to encourage each other that it's going to be temporary and good days will be coming. Now the reality is the generation that is judged for the most part, they will not experience the ice pack. Either they'll die off in the land of captivity. Some who were very young when it was conquered, and we're going to talk about, um, right now I'm referring to the southern kingdom, because the northern kingdom has already been carried off into captivity. Um, and when there is a return to rebuild everything, there will be a 70-year captivity. 70 years is how long uh, they're going to be taken out of the land. And, and God's going to see, you know, do you miss it now? So I got, a, I got a quick question. What if God was to do that here? And what happened was that a whole bunch of us were carried off. And let's say we were taken, we, we, we had to leave the United States of America. Wow. And we were taken to, let's say, Uzbekistan. <laughs> Or Russia. Too cold. Russia and China are talking about this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think you'd start to miss the United States of America? They would. Do you think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you probably think, boy, if we ever had a chance to go back, we would do things differently. We wouldn't allow ourselves to get to the place where God has to remove us from it, the blessing of that promised land. And maybe we would be able to hang on to it if we had another chance. Chapter 44, uh, I'm just going to let you, if you need to, review. You can review it yourself, the last chapter, or look at the video later when you get home. But let's just jump right into this. Verses 1 and 2. Somebody read the first two verses, please. But now listen, Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. This is what the Lord says, he who made you. Who formed you in the womb and who will help you? Don't be afraid, Jacob, my servant. Je Jezreel, who I, whom I have chosen. Okay, yep. So uh, Jeshurun, a uh, Hebrew word for uh, the upright one. Uh, they're they're not being upright now, but they will be. God is speaking positive. Uh, but God is saying right here, pretty much. It's going to be scary, but. <laughs> don't fear a very interesting thing for God to say they'd be scared they're, they're going to be scared to death when it comes but God is, is reminding them something listen um, you got to trust me in this you have to go through this you have to experience this you know, it's when Dad said, this is going to hurt me more than it hurts you. <laughs> right? And, and uh, it gives you the discipline. And so here's God reminding them, um, I chose you. I'm the one that made you. I formed you in the womb. Okay, I, right? I, I've taken you out of Egypt. I created this nation. 
that you are. Um, those are nice things to remember uh, before the, the, the heat goes up. Uh, verses 3, 4, 5, Summit. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and the streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in the meadow, like poplar trees, by flowing streams. Some will say, I belong to the Lord. Others will call themselves by the names of Jacob. Still others will write on their hand the Lord's and will take the name Israel. Ah, what's being described there? Again, God is painting a picture. Okay, again, things are going to become a wilderness, a wasteland, a desert. You know, think about it when an army comes in nowadays. Starts bombing and raiding and, I mean, well, what does the land become? It's a wasteland. Right, just desert, right? Just, just wiped out. God says the land's going to get wiped out, but I'm going to put some water back there. And some rivers going to come and some, you know, trees are going to grow again. At one point, um, he says, I'm going to pour out my spirit on your descendants. So it's not going to be your generation. Mm -hmm. That's a bummer. But down the road, you know, your great great grandkids might, I'm going to pour my spirit out on them. Well, when does that happen? Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, fulfillment of Joel chapter 2. Joel has said the same thing. You know, God said through Joel, I'm going to pour my spirit out on my sons and daughters. The day will come. And now it's you know, over 400 years down the road, but it comes. But God is saying it's going to come to your descendants. Um, and, and it's interesting where he says, you know, uh, one will say, I'm the Lord's. Another will be called by the name of Jacob. Another will write on, on their hand, the Lord's, and adopt the name of Israel. What's being prophesied there? Mm -hmm. Gentiles. Gentiles mm -hmm. are going to adopt, you know, my name. Um, they're going to they're gonna be grafted in. Well, God, that's, that's God's plan, is to extend salvation and <coughs> the family of God to everybody. All right, let's keep going. Um, six, seven, and eight. This is what the Lord says. Israel's king and redeemer, the Lord of heaven and armies. I am the first and the last. There is no other God who is like me. Let him step forward and prove to you his power. Let him do as I have done since ancient times, when I established a people and explained its future. Do not tremble, do not be afraid. Did I not proclaim my purpose for you long ago? You are my witnesses. Is there any other God? No, there is no other rock, not one. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, several titles here uh, describe God. Uh, he's the king. Their king, their redeemer, the almighty God. He's the first and the last. Um, and uh, Revelation 20, 22, 13, you know, God says, I am the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega. Uh, sure, this is God speaking. And, um, and then what's interesting, verse 7, who's like me? Hey, let them proclaim it. Let them declare and, and, and set that before me. And then he asks a rhetorical question. Who has announced... From of old, the things yet to come. Right? Who who is able outside of me, besides me, who can tell the future <clears throat> accurately? Nobody. Right? So, what? Keep your eye on that. That is now the theme as we go through tonight. Um, let's see. Let's go through. Um, let's go nine. Somebody nine to fourteen. How foolish are those who manufacture idol, idols to be their gods, these high, highly valued objects of really worthless. They themselves are witnesses that this is so, for their idols neither see nor know. No wonder those who worship them are put to shame. Who put a fool would who but a fool would make his own god, an idol that cannot help him one bit. All who worship idols will stand before the Lord in shame along with all these craftsmen, mere humans, who claim they can make a god, together they will stand in terror and shame. The blacksmiths stand at his forge to make a sharp tool, pounding and shaping it with all his might. 
His work makes him hungry and thirsty, weak and faint. So what? 14. 14. 14. Yeah, 14. Then the wood carver measures and marks out a block of wood, takes the tool and carves the figure of a man. Now he has a wonderful idol that cannot even move from where it is placed. He cuts down cedars, he selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the cedar in the forest to be nourished by the rain. Okay. Uh, where did you just say? Uh, 14. 14. Yeah, okay, uh, yeah, there's okay. Cave. Um, <laughs> what is God saying about idol worship? Don't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, 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 absolutely <clears throat> worthless and does absolutely nothing for the people that practice it. It only shows everybody how stupid they are, how spiritually blind and ignorant they are. And uh, how he's pretty much saying, you know, pagans, they view their worship of idols as, you know, meritorious. But ultimately, it is going to be their shame. And the fact that, that these craftsmen, the people that make it, are nothing but men themselves, like humans, like you. How does a human make a god? Can't. How do you, how does a, a fallen sinful one of us make something supposedly better than us? Yeah, yeah. no. That, that somehow will answer our prayers. Well, there's no frame of reference for it because they're not being it in the first place. Yeah, so this is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and you know, he's a blacksmith who gets you know, gets hungry while making an idol. Uh, it's funny. From metal, you know, a carpenter has to outline his idol on wood. You know, he, that shouldn't inspire confidence in, in, in the worship of their own idol. So, I mean, the idol, it does nothing, and you'd think, this is happening all over the world still today. There's countries that do this today. They, they make idols, and they place them all over the place, and we've talked about it at nauseam. A number of countries still do this, and they worship these things, knowing that other people make them. It gets even better when we get to verse 19. It gets even better. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Is that the difference with an idol that it's worshipped, an image that's worshipped? Or like if Leonardo da Vinci paints a painting, is that an idol? Um, Could be. Well, only if you no, it, no, it, it's a painting. But uh, you know, if Leonardo, oh, if, if Leonardo, if Leonardo da Vinci paints a painting, is that an idol? No, no. no. Um, you know, no, but, but if people pray to it. But if people. Oh, oh, no, Lisa. Grant <laughs> that I may be wealthy or something. That wasn't the first. It's money of I perhaps these makers. Yeah, that, that, that is their intent. Yeah, that yeah, wasn't uh, Da Vinci's intent. So, is money or not? <coughs> there's, and there's money in it? Is there money? Is money an idol? Oh, is money an idol? Oh, sure it is. Sure it is. Yeah, if people yeah, think of it more and spend their time and. Put their confidence on money, yeah. Put their confidence so, in so it. What about if someone is uh, self-absorbed and they hold themselves in that? Sure, you can make yourself an idol. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um, so uh, let's continue. Somebody, fifteen to twenty. Then it shall be for a man to burn, for he will take some of it and warm himself. Yes, he kindles it. And bakes bread. Indeed, he makes a god and worships it. He makes a carved image and falls down to it. He burns half of it in the fire. With this half, he eats meat. He roasts a roast and is satisfied. He even warms himself and says, Ah, I am warm. I have seen the fire. And the rest of it he makes into a god, his carved image. He falls down before it and worships it. Prays to it and says, Deliver me, for you are my god. <coughs> They do not know nor understand, for he has shut their eyes so that they cannot see, and their hearts so they cannot understand. And no one considers in his heart, nor is there knowledge nor understanding to say, I have burned half of it in the fire. Yes, I have also baked bread on its coals. I have roasted meat and eaten it, and I shall make the rest of it an abomination. Shall I fall down before a block of wood? He feeds on ashes, a deceived heart has turned him aside, and he cannot deliver his soul, nor say, is there any lie in my right hand? 
Okay, so the people that make the idols, they don't even think of the incongruity of using, you know, part of this piece of wood that they're making the idol out of for fuel for baking and, and, and roasting, you know, and then they, the other part they make an idol out of it, um, uh, and uh, then he says to worship wood is to, to feed on ashes. Um, so trusting in totally something worthless, something that deceives. Um, I want you to really think about this. Entire countries, entire <coughs> nations of people do this. Even today, mm -hmm. they believe in these idols. They worship them that somebody has made. It happens today. It is like believing men can have menstrual cycles and men can become pregnant. <laughs> yep. And how much of America believes that today? <laughs> Too many. By what you see in the news, it looks like yeah. most are. God forbid you say they're nuts. Yeah. Right? God forbid you say the emperor's got no clothes on. <laughs> He's yeah. naked. Right. You know? Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, it's the insanity uh, that a... a that a human can possess when they have left God. Now, isn't that Romans 1? Mm -hmm. If you worship the creation over the creator, it's a matter of time. If, if you say, I don't exist, it's a matter of time until you believe the unthinkable, mm -hmm. the most ridiculous. Well, it's, you're right. So, it's, you know, nothing known to the sun is happening again. Okay, and I am excited where we're going. In this, well, the same uh, as, this passage, the same huh? as the ancestor worship in China. Sure. You know, they worship. <clears throat> they put out food at night. Sure. Before they go to bed, they have sure. a bowl of food by the front door <laughs> to feed the ancestors that come. Yeah, and the cats. <laughs> <They're> <laughs> mostly, uh, no, it's mostly dogs. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, 21, 2, and 3. Remember these, O Jacob, and Israel, for you are my servant. I have formed you. You are my servant. O Israel, you will not be forgotten by me. I have blotted out like a thick cloud your transgressions, and like a cloud your sins. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Sing, O heavens, for the Lord has done it. Shout your lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, your mountains. O forest and every tree in it, for the Lord has redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. Okay, so what's God doing right there? Has he created a contrast between Israel and the deluded people that make idols and worship idols? Okay, yeah, believers in Israel, you know, they were redeemed, but idol makers were deceived. Israel was to remember that God can foretell the future. Uh, idols are really nothing. They, they can't tell you anything. Uh, so, you worship me, he says, I'll forgive all your sins. It's like as good as done already. He speaks as if it's already done. If you only turn to me, I'll redeem you. Um, and uh, 24... To 28 now. This is what the Lord says, you Redeemer who formed you in the womb. I am the Lord who has made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who foils the signs of the false prophets and makes fools of diviners, who overthrows the learning of the wise and turns it into nonsense, who carries out the words of his servants and fulfills the predictions of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, I shall be inhabited, of the towns of Judah they shall be built, and of, the ru and of their ruins I will restore them. Who says to the watery deep, be dry, and I will dry up your streams. Who says to Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and will accomplish all that I please. He will say of Jerusalem, let it be rebuilt, and of the temple, let its foundations be laid. No one but God. 
<laughs> yeah, that was a whole chapter. Bill just went, oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> go, Pastor Scott. <laughs> Here we go. God now says, he, after just talking about what uselessness idols are, there are no gods at all, and he's been saying, there's no God but me, right? I'm the only one besides me. There's no other. That's verse, verse 6 of chapter 44. I'm it. Only I can do things. I, what? I formed you, again, I formed you. Individually in the womb, I formed you as a nation. I have the power to do, who can do that. Who alone stretched out the heavens? By myself, because only I can do this. I spread out the earth. I frustrate the omens of liars. I make fools of fortune tellers, diviners. I make their knowledge appear what it is, foolish. And uh, who confirms the word of his servants, so his own prophets. God says, I confirm what they say, because I gave them what to say. Mm -hmm. And then I make it come true. Mm -hmm. Okay? And he says, and fulfills the prediction of his messengers, who says of Jerusalem, what? It shall be inhabited. The cities of Judah, they shall be rebuilt. Talking about what? In the future after the judgment comes. Now this even gets more specific. Not only is he saying, here's a prophecy for you. I'm going to take you, you're going to be disciplined. You're going to go through, as you're going to see in a moment, 70 years. You're going to be carried off into captivity. But, it will be rebuilt. Where you are right now, it's going to be leveled, but it's going to be rebuilt. Not only that, he says what? Verse 28. Who says of Cyrus? Cyrus. King in the he is my shepherd. He shall carry out all my purpose. And who says of Jerusalem, it shall be rebuilt. And of the temple, your foundation shall be laid. Who's Cyrus? A king in the future. King, king in the future. Yeah. So God says, not only will this be rebuilt, I'm going to give you the name, I'm going to give you the very name of the king that's going to oversee it. He's going to, he's going to order the rebuilding of this place. The rebuilding of Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple. Because both are going to be laid to waste. Mm -hmm. Did you catch this? Mm -hmm. God is saying right here, to Isaiah, through Isaiah to the people, your idols have been a waste of time. Let me show you the difference between them and me. You're going to go away. <laughs> I'm going to bring you back. A generation later will come on back. Everything here will be rebuilt. And the king's name, who's going to order the rebuilding, is Cyrus. He predicts that 150 years in advance. It's 150 years before it happens. Here's the fun part. This... By naming even Cyrus, that would, uh, this guy's going to release the Jewish exiles to do the rebuilding. It, it points to God alone as the one that knows all things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, part of being the real God and only God is knowing all things all the time. Yep. Uh, if he didn't, then this would mean that God's no different from idols. <laughs> the very point of what Isaiah is disproving. So what I want you to do is uh, flip uh, backwards, because you have to, to the end of Second Chronicles, chapter 22. I mean, uh, Uh, it's going to be verse 22. I mean, um, uh, 36. Chapter 36, verse 22. Second like Chronicles 36. <clears throat> uh, I want to remind you, uh, our English translations are not in the order of the Jewish Bible. They're, uh, they're organized differently. Uh, but the, these books are actually at the end. The Chronicles are at the end, followed by Ezra and Nehemiah as an addendum to the scriptures. 
Um, but here we go. Are you all at Second Chronicles? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So at at the end of Second Chronicles, <clears throat> that we're, we're we're coming close to as we're studying Second Kings. Okay. Uh, do you remember all this? Okay, real quick. Vaguely. In case you don't know, okay. If you want to read a summary of the entire Old Testament, minus Ezra and Nehemiah, read the first and second chronicles. Second chronicles. Right? It takes you from Adam to the end of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. First and second chronicles is a summary of the Old Testament. At the very end of Second Chronicles, it tells us, it leaves us at an order being given. And uh, let's look at it. Verse 22, somebody read 22 and 23. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he set the proclamation throughout his kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he's appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may the Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. Did you catch that? So in the first year that King Cyrus is king of Persia, uh, and then the chronicler writes, in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah, uh, we're going to... Uh, we're gonna, Cover a bunch of these all real quick and it'll all come together. Jeremiah. Wait, we were reading this in Isaiah. Isaiah. Yeah. Right. Okay, well, real quick. Keep keep a finger there. Go to Jeremiah 25. <laughs> so this is after Isaiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 25. Verse 12. <laughs> Somebody read Isaiah 25, verse 12. Then it will be when, every, when 70 years have completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, declares the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans, and I will make it for an everlasting desolation. Okay, did you hear that? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, so God says at the end of 70 years, ah, so that's how we know it's going to be 70 years. So Jeremiah gives the, the time that they're going to be in captivity. God says, I'm going to what? I'm going to make it desolate. Punish the Babylonians. I'm going to punish the Babylonians. Well, why? Who were they? They're, they're, they're the, the ones, ones that were carrying <laughs> Judah off into captivity. Right. Yes. Provided the spanking. Now, how does he do that? How does he punish Babylon at the end of the seven years? I'll tell you in a second. <laughs> he does it by Cyrus, through Cyrus. I'll show you in a moment. Go to chapter 29 now of Jeremiah, verse 10. 29, verse 10? 29, verse 10. What's it say? Mm. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's seventy years are completed, will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise, and bring you back to this place. Okay, stay right there. God says, after this, here's the second time he goes, after seventy years, okay, I will bring you back to this place. Then what's next what's the next verse? For I know the plans yes, I have for you. Says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not your not for harm. Plans for future and no hope. Then, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart. Got it. Mm -hmm. Ah, wait, Jeremiah 20 and I 11. That's, oh, that's we my, quote that all the time. That's my life for I know first. plans for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper. Yeah. To give you hope in the future, not to harm you. We say that all the time. Yeah. Well, what's the context of it? The context well, after was... I've kicked your rear end for 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to bring you back. Okay, I'm going to bring you back to this land. 
Because, because my heart for you is to prosper you. It is to give you hope in the future. But you got to listen. Okay? So that's why I can tell you it's going to be temporary. You're going to have to keep that in mind. And you're going to have to tell the people who are going to be born in captivity, your kids are going to be born there, that listen, you got to wait out you know, this many years, and you'll, maybe you'll be part of the group that goes back and rebuilds because God says it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, because God the says, then Ryan. there's the famous promise, Jeremiah 29, 11, and that's the thing. We can't take that out of context and apply that to ourselves at any time we want, even though I think it applies to what God wants for us. It is specifically, when it was spoken, it you applies to us. After the 70 years, I'm going to bring you back. 70 years of captivity. All right, so now you know the context of Jeremiah 29, 11, and you can now come back to the end of Second Chronicles. Bill? I, I've been thinking this whole time, if, if they're going to be gone 70 years, then most of the adults will not get to come back. That's right. That's so right. It's not a matter of them changing their hearts. They're going to have to instill in their children's hearts yep. the right. value that was, yep. that got left behind, so that they have an appreciation for something yes. they've truly never seen. Yes. Mm-hmm. And it's, it is amazing. When we go there, what you're saying right there, that's it's... Yes, we 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 can we'll spend a night just on that, on who it is that actually comes back to rebuild, and what happens after it's rebuilt. If you remember in Ezra, in the book of Ezra, um, there's people crying out when they see the temple rebuilt, and and the people who never saw the first one because they were born in captivity. Well, this is great; they're celebrating, and and then and, but the older people it says they're. They're crying and weeping because it wasn't as good as that one before. It wasn't as glorious. They're looking back. But the younger ones, they didn't have anything to compare it to. They go, hey, first one who wears up, we think this is fantastic. And that's when you hear, do not despise the day of small things. So here we go. Mm -hmm. Now you read the end of 2 Chronicles. All right, now look right next. What follows is Ezra. Who's Ezra? He's the priest that King Cyrus says you can go back and rebuild. So look at uh, Ezra chapter 1 and uh, somebody read um, 1 to 4. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all his kingdom. And also in a written edict declared, Thus says King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people, may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings from the house of God in Jerusalem. Do you catch that? A national This is call. amazing. This is huge. Ezra gives us a little more detail. Because he's alive to write this all down. He's the one that writes Ezra. And, and he is saying, again, just like the end of Second Chronicles, the first year of King Cyrus of Persia, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment, in fulfillment to what we just read in the prophet Jeremiah, that after the end of 70 years, there's going to be a, a returning and a rebuilding. But it was Isaiah that gives us the name of the king, the king. who does the order of Cyrus. Mm-hmm. And we're going we're to go back in a moment to uh, Isaiah, and read two more times when Cyrus is mentioned, and uh, and what God tells Cyrus to do. But did you catch this? Thus, this is what King Cyrus says, verse two. He said this all out around his country. The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He's charged me to build a house. Uh, build, build him a house at Jerusalem of Jew. What? Is he a Jew? No. No. Um, any of those among you who are of his people, you are Jewish? Hey, may, may your God be with you. And you're permitted to go back to Jerusalem in Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. 
He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, goods, with animals, etc., etc., etc. And what we find out, even in Nehemiah, he, he pays for everything. Mm -hmm. Cyrus sends the lumber, the tools, the money. It's amazing what he does. He first sends Ezra back to rebuild the temple. Then Nehemiah, because it's the book that comes after Ezra. Remember, he's a cupbearer. Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's in the king's court. And he's going... Um, yeah, so, I, I don't, uh, King, can I talk to you about something? You know, that's some of our heavy peeps, on my you're heart. back, and you know, they're there. I'm one of them peeps. You know, I'm one of these Jews. Can I go back and um, be a part of, of this thing? And Cyrus, oh, absolutely. Now, I want to ask, why would King Cyrus do this? Why is King Cyrus of Persia all up and excited about the God of the Jews? He's his power. He, got, he recognizes his power. He got, right. a, got a revelation. All right. Um, let me see what I can do here real quick. He recognizes where, where all of the good in the flesh came from also. Okay. Okay. Um, he says Jerusalem's going to be you know, rebuilt. Cyrus allows the exiles to go back rebuild the temple. We've got to back up a little bit. In, it's in 15, uh, 586 B.C. that Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, he, um, he breaks through Jerusalem's walls. They burn down the houses, the temple, and they carry many captives away into exile. Most famous are four, Daniel, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego. Mm -hmm. Cyrus is the founder of the Persian Empire. He first comes to the throne of what's called Anshan in eastern Elam in 559 B.C. In 549 B.C., he conquers the Medes. He becomes the ruler of the combined Persian Medium Mede Empire. In 538 B.C., he conquers Babylon. You read about that in Daniel chapter 5. We won't go there. Uh, because if you notice in Daniel's prophecies, all these kings... You see Nebuchadnezzar, then Balthazar, and then, okay, then Cyrus pops up. Okay, you, oh, there, you, Darius. Oh, these significant well, Darius. He's, mm -hmm. he's he, he, he just kind of stays stays put as different kings conquer each other and just keep taking over the government. Make sense? And he's, he's, the, he's the institutional knowledge. <clears throat> Daniel just kind of stays through all those different kings. Quite fascinating. Um... It's the very year that he conquers Babylon ah, in, fulfillment, in fulfillment to what God said through Jeremiah. He goes, I'm going to destroy Babylon. I'm going to punish it. How did he do it? Through Cyrus. Because Cyrus comes in and he, he takes it over. He goes to war with the Babylonians. Okay? And that's in 549 B.C. Uh, 539 B.C. <coughs> Um, in, in doing this releasing God's people to rebuild the temple and Jerusalem he catches it it's as if he's now God's shepherd mm -hmm. and the returnees build the temple they complete it in 515 BC and years later in 444 BC Nehemiah goes and rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem um, go back to Isaiah. 40, 45. First four verses of it. Thus says the Lord who is anointed. To Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and loose the armor of kings, to open before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut, I will go before you and make the crooked places straight, I will break in pieces the gates of bronze and cut the bars of iron, I will give you the treasures of darkness and the riches of secret places, 
that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by your name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name. I have named you, though you have not known me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There is no God beside me. I will gird you, though you have not known me. Okay, perfect. You catching that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Your memory serves you well. Cyrus said uh, in the book of Ezra, and also recorded at the very end of 2 Chronicles, the God of the Jews, the God of that place, Israel, you know, of Jerusalem, has ordered me has ordered to me. do this. Mm -hmm. He's given me authority. He's given me the kingdoms of the world. The mission. He's put me in charge. Mm -hmm. How does he know that? God told him. When Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar, mm -hmm. conquered Judah and took with him the brightest and the best, mm -hmm. who they took the scribes, mm -hmm. the prophets, the priests, to assimilate them, to include them, to learn what they know, and to learn about their religion. That's what you did back then. Mm -hmm. When Cyrus, 70 years after that, is in power, the scrolls of the Jews are still there, the sacred scrolls. Mm -hmm. Isaiah is, is pointing to something that... I say you can fill fill in the blanks. I believe it's Ezra, who is the priest, whose job is to take care of the Jewish scriptures. He would have brought to Cyrus the, the scroll. Isaiah scroll mm -hmm. and opened it to what we call chapter 44 and 45 and said, is this you? <laughs> <laughs> And here is Cyrus reading this ancient Jewish scroll from written 150 years earlier. <laughs> and he's going, how did that, how did you know that? And God says in Isaiah, he says, you don't know me, but I call out to you in the future, Cyrus. You will order that my people go back and rebuild. Jerusalem, specifically, the prophecy God speaks in Isaiah was to Cyrus. Direct. Cyrus reads the Bible of his day, you might say, sees his own name in it. Imagine. Imagine. And he's reading this, and go, oh, I guess I better obey. I better <laughs> right? And all of a sudden he realizes something. The guy's in charge. He is the power. He, he is the most powerful human being on the earth at that time. He has conquered all the nations. Mm -hmm. He's got all the land, all the power. And he reads this where God said, I'm going to give you power. I'm going to arm you to take over and... and, and be the king of the world. So he it's absolutely amazing. Right. Now, there's so much here. Watch this. He has to recognize that there's something out there more powerful than he is. And oh, yeah. Yeah. So he realizes, because it was foretold, this, that's how he got it. And it's specifically the God of these people. These people. These Jews. That he didn't conquer. He has no beef with the Jews. Mm -hmm. He simply conquers Babylon, and there's all these Jews having to be there who have been there for 70 years now in captivity. And Cyrus goes, Okay. You know, I like your bagels. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, uh, and you can imagine, at, at one point, Ezra goes, um, do you, do you ever wonder why, how we got here? 
why we're here. And, you know, I'm sure they fill in the information. They, 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 they tell him. He sees it. He's, you know he's read the Isaiah scroll. I'm sure he read more than just where his name is mentioned. Mm -hmm. I'm certain Cyrus sat down with his scribes and he has read everything we are reading tonight. Mm -hmm. Everything we are reading tonight, this ancient king Cyrus read. Did you, uh, let that get a grip of your brain. Right? Mm -hmm. He has read all of Isaiah. He has studied about who this God is about the Messiah to come, and catch this. Chapter 45, verse 1. Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose Who? hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes to open doors before him, etc. What? Oh. It's yeah. as if Cyrus... I am, again, this, the, the context of this whole thing, idols are nothing. False gods are nothing. Mm -hmm. I alone have all the power to do anything I want. And he says, Cyrus, I'm the one that grabbed your hand. He says that. Yes, he did. I grabbed your hand, and I waved that sword, buddy. It was me. And I gave you victory. And that's why you're now in charge. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Cyrus is going to be overwhelmed and turn his attention to this God. I want you to notice something. Verse 1, what does God call Cyrus? Before Cyrus is even born, he calls him something what? Anointed. Oh, wait, wait. What is anoint, anointed one? What is that in Hebrew? Adam. Adam. In Hebrew? Mashiach. Oh. Uh, uh, oh, please. God calls Cyrus Messiah. He didn't say he was the Messiah. He said, you're my anointed one. You're my Messiah for the moment. He calls Cyrus, you're my Messiah. You're my anointed That's what it means. My anointed one. I have anointed you. I am, I'm working out my will through you. As if I am in you, Cyrus, and I'm walking the earth. Well... And we're getting things done so that my word is fulfilled. Yep. No wonder he's, he's adamant at using all the gold and silver at his command to rebuild this for the, the fellow that just said he's the Messiah. He now knows, yes, he owes everything to God. For everything he's got, he owes this God for it. He is overwhelmed that this God has done something no God, no false God, no, no false, false God, God. nowhere he's ever done anywhere in history, and named a king 150 years earlier in an ancient prof prophetic scroll and said what he would do. He realizes this is exactly where I'm at in, in history, and I might as well fulfill the rest of the stuff that it says I'm supposed to do. And so he goes, hey, the Bible's kept the kitchen, the Isaiah scroll. God says, God Cyrus. Said. You're going to order my people to go back and rebuild. Mm -hmm. Cyrus reads that. He goes, well, I get, I get busy. <laughs> Do you get that? Mm -hmm. So he sees two things. He sees that he is he's the head of the, the biggest empire on earth at that time. God says, because I, gave, you a, I oh, gave it to you. He realized that. God also says, and now these aren't the droids you're looking for. Right? <laughs> you are going to send my people back. They're going to rebuild Jerusalem. And Cyrus goes, absolutely. Yes, I have God. To, I, you know, my job is to keep fulfilling this. And he does. Mm -hmm. Mind blowing. Okay. Uh, you got you to stay. We got to finish. Okay. He's going to be mentioned one more time. And uh, let's see. Let's go. Gosh. Uh, Uh, five through eight. Or, uh, I think somebody read, I think Stuart, you already read five, so six, seven, eight. If they may know from the rising. Oh. Six, seven, eight. Yeah. If they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me, I am the Lord and there is no other. Go again. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. Mm hmm. 
Rain down, you heavens from above, and let the skies pour down righteousness. Let the earth open, let them bring forth salvation, and let righteousness spring up together. I, the Lord, have created it. Okay, pretty powerful. Okay, again, God's uniqueness is stressed. You know, God's going, there's no other. I'm the only God. I'm the only one. And he just, and he's proving it. Okay? Um, by knowing the future. And it uh, does get fulfilled. Uh, let's see. Um, 9 to 13. Somebody? What sorrow awaits those who argue with their creator? Does a clay pot argue with its maker? Ah, Does a clay dispute with the one who shapes it, saying, Stop, you're doing it wrong? Does a pot explain, How clumsy can you be? How terrible it would be if a newborn baby said to its father, Why was I born? Or if to his mother, Why did you make me this way? How far? 13. This is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and your Creator. Do you question what I do for my children? Do you give me orders about the work of my hands? I am the one who made the earth and created the people to live on. With my hands, I stretched out the heavens. All the stars are at my command. I will raise up Cyrus to fulfill my righteous purpose, and I will guide his actions. He will restore my city and free my captive people. Without seeking a reward, I, the Lord, and heaven, army, have spoken. Wow! you catch that? <clears throat> Once again, God reinforces, I am the only God in existence. I am the created everything. He goes back to creation. Sure, Genesis 1. Absolutely. That's what sets our God apart from all the other gods worship. You know, again, in many cult cultures and countries, ancient, modern, there's a God of the trees and a God of the fish. A God of the air, a God of this, a God of that, a God of this, a God of that. No. Only the Jews have one God, one God, who made everything. Everything. Of course, Muslims believe the same thing. But uh, all comes from the Jewish people. And again, Cyrus's task is stated that he's going to free the exiles to go rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And he's going to do it for free. Is that funny? So, Cyrus is reading all this, and it's, I just, I, I, I think about what it would have been like to have been Cyrus, and he gets down to this part. Oh, what? My, my name's here again. And, and it says, and Cyrus, um, I've aroused Cyrus in righteousness. That's nice. Yes. I will make his path straight. <coughs> again, that's very interesting. That, that's, that was uh, spoken about John the Baptist, his job is Prepare the make, way for the Lord, make straight those paths for the Messiah to come. Okay, mm -hmm. to simply to make it easy to part the Red Sea for the, 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 the anointed person's job. Okay, so God makes it easy for him to do. Um, that he's going to build my city and set my exiles free. free. Aren't you, Cyrus? <laughs> yeah, it says right here, I'm going to set them free. And he goes, okay, everybody, um, I guess I'm supposed to say you're free. So you're free. For free. It would be hard to argue. Hard to argue. And then it's not for price or reward. Right. Are you, Cyrus? You're not going to charge them for their freedom? Are you? No. You're not going to. You're not going to take coyote money from them. You're not going to. You know, you're, you're not going to charge each person ten grand and, to get back home. No. No. You're going to just. You know, and, and no reward for you either. He's smart enough. Right. You're going to just humble it. Yeah, he's already been paid. He's already you know, been paid. There you, you go. Know, you know, because you know the God if. For him to see this is to know, wow, this, this, I've never experienced anything like this in my life. This whole deal is real. This, the God of the Jews, is this God, real. is real. the only God you know that Cyrus has ever known or understood or even attempted to worship that actually did anything. There you go. Because the Persians weren't worshiping God. They were worshiping their false gods. They did nothing. They delivered on nothing. So again, um, he's just taken. He's taken with the God of the Jews and is uh, and then he orders everybody to uh, follow God and and uh, and, he, and he orders everybody in the kingdom. Hey, give those Jews give them. what they need to go build. We're going to buff them out. Uh, it's just it's just a phenomenal thing. Mike. So, do we have any indication that Cyrus did in fact end up worshiping no. the God of Israel? Mm. And that's that's a disappointment. Um, it doesn't look like, um, historically, he ever made a full conversion to Judaism. Um, <clears throat> nonetheless, God used him. Yeah. 
There so, um, did he win all of those battles before he read, read his battle? name? Yes. Yes. So he had to. He had to equate the A. That Absolutely. Said, sure. I win and well, that's right. Yep. People. Yep. And I did. Yep. So I'm gonna throw my money yep. at Exactly. That, that's what we were saying a little while ago. Yeah. That 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 he looks at the scriptures that foretells that that God is going to grant him the um, the power and the authority uh, to conquer and all this. And and after the point, obviously he this has happened. And, uh, and then he, I, I think it's easy to understand, that's when he then saw the scroll, because he wouldn't have seen it until he came into battle where mm -hmm. the scrolls were. Mm -hmm. He had to first conquer it. Before he conquered that, he had to conquer all of the, the, the Empire of Media. And so, fascinating. That's where we'll stop tonight. Good. Yes. Isn't there just one? <laughs>